A very good evening to all of you. So it's an honor and proud privilege to welcome you all on the occasion of 7th Professor Pushpa Talwar Oration, which is being delivered by Professor Catherine Lagru from Belgian National Reference Center for Mycosis, Belgium. So I'll request our esteemed director, Professor Vivek Lal, to present a bouquet to Professor Catherine Lagru and welcome her. Thank you, sir. So now I would request our Honorable Director, sir, to deliver the welcome address. So I, I saw a very familiar face when I walked in. You know, Professor Pushpa Talwar, YN Mehra, because I have the Dean sitting here. I don't know, this generation doesn't know just how we reached where we are, the pedestal where we are on. It's because of legends like her. <laughs> Professor Catherine Legra was saying she's, you know, she searched the internet and she read about him, about her. I said, I'll tell you more about her. I read in between the lines for you. So we all know Pushpa Talwar. I don't know how many of you have really had the honor, the distinction, the 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 feel of having been associated with her. I did as a student. I did when I had become an assistant professor. And of course, she was my patient for a while before she retired. And she had diabetes and she had some complications because of diabetes. So that's how I, I found her to be a very, very noble patient. She never questioned me. It's only later did I come to know that she's heading microbiology. <clears throat> She did her MBEBS from Lady Harding, probably the most iconic of iconic colleges in India at that time. One of the most famous colleges east of Swiss. It was such a famous college at that time. It still is, but now there are other colleges which are competing with it. But at that time, it was a standalone monolith. She went on to do her you know, fellowship in uh, UK, and then she joined here in 1963, I think. She, she, you know, she joined this institute in 1963, the year of its inception. The institute has been around since 1963. She stayed back along with her husband and took mycology. She started the first, she midwifed, she is the Florence Nightingale of mycology in India. I'm using a very specific phrase. She is the Florence Nightingale of mycology in India. At that time when we were doing her MD and she would, there were hardly any, you know, fungal culture bottles around. She insisted that every patient in an emergency, every, you know, every outlet, an emergency outlet must have fungal culture bottles. And she, I remember, used to come to the hospital ensuring that there was an adequate supply of fungal culture bottles. I do not know how things are now. Things would have advanced so much. But I'm just telling you, she would come with the technical staff going around all over. And we would kind of look at that lady, who's this lady who's insisting that mycology be given center stage. She got to us through her commitment. And we got to her through our will to learn. We, in fact, if I'm not wrong, today there is absolutely no division between Nehru Hospital and A and B block. Let me tell you that. Today, clinical science, basic science, and basic sciences are the same. Believe me. We've reached that level of excellence, you know, that everything is, after a certain stage, almost the same. But at that time, there was a demilitarized zone, North Korea versus South Korea. And we were on this side and she was on that side. But I remember distinctly that we would go to her and implore her to take her classes on mycology, not because of anything else, but because she, before you took over, was brilliant in mucormycosis. She taught us so much about mucormycosis. I remember she and Shubak Seigel having, uh, you know, friendly banter, exchanging friendly banter on histoplasmosis also. That is the level of, you know, that is how she was involved in starting mycology in this part of the world. And probably it was probably the first lab in India, which obviously you took over and took it to another level. I, I had just one request. You see, when we celebrate these, you know, when we have these orations, we are celebrating a personality. We are celebrating a personality. Pushpa Talwar is an icon. She was an iconic icon. She was an iconic icon. Not many would know how much this institute owes to her, 
I'm not saying the Department of Microbiology. I'm saying that institute owes to her as its existence. At that time, there used to be a Department of Microbiology. We used to go up to second floor. Oh my, what was that? Second floor B block and would come back getting a few reports here and there. And she would be in the corridor. Why have you come? Have you, do you know what is the relevance of this report? I still remember her. She as a professor would be standing in the corridor with her trademark sari. You know, her trademark sari, she would be standing. And we always wanted to bump into her because we would learn a thing or two from her. Why you come here? You know the relevance of this report. Why did you send this report? I often said my senior resident told me to. So that's why I sent this report. Now you go and ask the senior resident, was this necessary, not necessary? So things like that were so mundane with her, you know, that she taught us more through, you know, informal teaching, informal teaching. She was, as you would have checked on the net, she had almost everything to her credit, everything to her credit, but that does not do credit to her personality. That is the purpose of such an oration, that she was different. She was totally committed. And I was telling you at lunchtime, she often took out, you know, she often paid from her own pocket for things if it did not work out with the government of India. I have seen that happen. I have seen that. I have seen that happen with my own eyes and I've... You know, I'm witness to that. I can't share all those things with you. But I can tell you at that time, that was the level of, I would say, intellectual excellence, innocent intellectual excellence that existed in PGI. It wasn't paper-oriented. No, it wasn't paper-oriented. Catherine, it wasn't paper-oriented. It was patient-oriented. It was patient-oriented, I'm telling you. And so if a patient benefit, never mind. Vivek, you go to this sector, sector 24. I still remember, you know, we would go there, we would get the address from her and we'd go there, here and there and get a few things. 16 sector, I still remember I went for some pipettes because she wanted them. She said, they are finished here, no point going. If you want your patient uh, to benefit, get me these, this, you know, get me this stack of pipettes. And I gladly did that. Not me, everyone. We were kind of learning from her. And so when I met Catherine, I thought, let me introduce this personality she is going to honor today. And she said, it's an honor. I said, it's reciprocal. She has got a plethora of uh, you know, feathers in her cap. I don't know how she holds that cap on her head. When I was seeing your CV, ma'am, probably your cap would be falling again and again. So many feathers there. But light feathers together become very heavy. And uh, I'm really grateful and honored to be here at this, you know, in this oration. I just want that this, this oration should continue. Her legacy should continue so that you know how PGI achieved its colossal level of excellence. I think the head of the department, microbiology in Delhi, is also her student, or someone, you know, uh, number two would be her student. You know, her student, I still remember. I don't remember the name, but I know the face, right? And things all over India. She is the Florence Nightingale of mycology, undisputed. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So now I would request uh, Professor Neelam Taneja, head of the Department of Medical Microbiology, to say a few words. Uh, good afternoon, all. Respected Director, PGI, Professor Veklal, Subdean Academics, Professor Naresh Panda, Dr. Katrine Lagru and colleagues, faculty colleagues, students, and uh, staff. So it's my proud privilege to be present here as a, representing the Department of Medical Microbiology for this uh, oration. And uh, this oration was started, uh, we have heard about from uh, Professor uh, RDPGI, sir, that uh, about Dr. Pushpa Talwar, I have also had the honor of uh, meeting her two or three times when she came to the department. I was absolutely new at that time, but I was impressed by the dedication she had. And many of you will not know that she was a highly spiritual person. And uh, so I was introduced to her by Dr. Meera Sharma, the then, then head of the department. And uh, she was the founder of mycology division and she worked tirelessly. Everybody told us that she was working uh, late and her husband was waiting always, who was a surgeon, was a busy surgeon, but he waited for her every day because she will not leave mycology lab for a little late. And uh, we welcome her family children, Mr. Ajay Talwar and Ms. Anu Chawla, who have joined the function online through YouTube. 
and uh, the first the oration the pushpa talwar oration happened in 2012 february and it was given by professor jack mees uh, by netherland then we had quite a few luminaries of mycology like david denning oliver cornelly and cornelia and malcolm and john perfect and this is the seventh such oration and uh, i would like shiva prakash to introduce uh katrin lagaru to the audience so good evening to you all uh, it's actually my pleasure to introduce uh, professor katrin uh, lagaru uh, the orator of uh, seventh uh, pushpa talwar memorial oration so professor katrin lagaru is the chair of the microbiology immunology and transplantation department at university hospital leuven belgium she is also full time professor on faculty of medicine of uh, university of leuven and she initially she obtained her master degree in the pharmaceutical science from uh, university of leuven in 1992 and uh, there they she completed laboratory medicine uh, and uh, during this period she also received a micro the degree of mycology from the institute of uh, tropical medicine in antwerp belgium and she did her uh, phd in 2002 in the with uh, pneumococcal uh, uh, pneum, pneum, streptococcal pneumonia and uh, she, professor lagros main interest uh, is the diagnosis and treatment of infection in severely immunocompromised patient especially focusing the pulmonary aspergillosis and she has uh, many many awards and occupying many important position in the european group so to name i will not name many all of, all of them because it is uh, Uh, i would like more to hear from her rather than this one so some of the few things are she is a coordinator of belgium national reference center for mycosis and she was a president of uh, belgium society for human and animal mycology and also secretary and for secretary for general secretary for european confederation of medical mycology so she was a chair of uh, also the academy of ecmm that is european confederation of medical mycology and she represent uh, uh ucast uh, afst anti fungal susceptibility testing and also a member of uh, ucast afst steering committee so she has got uh, many publications to her uh, this one so she has published more than 320 uh, peer uh, articles in uh, peer reviewed uh, journals and also she has four chapter so now i uh, invite uh, professor katrin lagro to deliver her pushpa talwar oration Good evening and thank you so much for these nice introductions. Actually, I will start with a small story. I was married in 1995 and the year after my husband and myself decided to plan a holiday abroad, a more long distance holiday, and we realized that later on when children would come that this would become far more difficult. So we thought we will do this the first year we're married, but we have to choose a country to go to. And I think you already know from the picture. Uh, we, we came to India and I, I really can say from my heart that we were de- impressed by, by the beauty of the country and also the beauty of the people here. What I did not know at that time, I was still busy with my five-year specialization in clinical biology and just knowing the basic of mycology. So I did not know at that time that here at this institute, Professor Pushpa Talwar already established a separate mycology laboratory more than 20 years or about 20 years ago. And really seeing the importance of medical mycology at that time was really visionary. Uh, so for me, it is really a tremendous honor to be here, to give, to receive this award and to give this oration. Thank you so much for this. And during my talk, I want to discuss with you some issues. I first want to go, discuss with you the changing epidemiology we are facing and then tell you some things about new diagnostic tests and also for antifungal agents, there is some news uh, and also some positive news and I want to end with that. So the prevalence of evasive fungal infections really continues to increase and this because of different reasons. First of all, because the population at risk is expanding. Of course, 
the traditional at-risk patients are still there, being the hematological patient population, but we also have an increasing population that uh, are being transplanted, populations is getting older, and then we recognize new at-risk groups, mainly in an ICU setting. And also, we are facing infections due to resistance strains, intrinsically resistance strains, but also strains that acquired resistance. And then also during the popularization of travel, travel, we also see that the areas of endemic mycosis are expanding. And all these things really uh, necessitate specialized diagnostic tools and special mycological expertise. And let's focus first a little bit on invasive aspergillosis and the ICU population. Yet yeah, this is also a domain where my research uh, has been for, for a prolonged period of time. And so as you see here, there is a really very broad group nowadays at risk in the ICU setting, whereas we have these traditional hematological patients. But we also, and more recently, recognize the risk of uh, pulmonary aspergillosis in patients with a viral infection, influenza, COVID-19, and a broad group of other patient populations. And this really poses several challenges. In this patient population, it's much more difficult to make the distinction between colonization and infection than in the hematological neutropenic patient population. These infections do come with a high mortality. For the diagnosis of fungal infections, we often rely very much also on imaging and CT scanning, but uh, these findings are often aspecific. And so we really need biomarkers to make the diagnosis, but we don't have yet the optimal biomarkers and also not yet the optimal diagnostic algorithm. And of course, it's not only about aspergillosis in the ICU. These patients might also be at risk for other invasive fungal, fungal infections, being invasive candidiasis, pneumocystis pneumonia, mucormycosis, amongst others. And so about these viral infection-associated pulmonary aspergillosis, we learned a lot during the last years. For influenza, if we see in our own hospital and several other uh, European hospitals, we see that the uh, co-infection with um, aspergillus, the incidences of aspergillosis in this influenza patients in ICU goes up to 20%. In COVID-19 patients, it's a little bit lower, but it ranges around 15%. And for influenza, doing prospective trials, we've learned that actually most of these infections occur very, very rapidly. We actually do diagnose them mostly upon admission in ICU. And there is, in a, a big percentage also of these patients, we see that there is really angioinvasive and also positive biomarkers in the blood. Whereas for COVID-19, it's a little bit different the story there. There, the infection typically comes later on while in ICU when the patient is deteriorating and the percentage of angioinvasion is also lower. But also here, high mortality in the patients suffering from this disease. And I just selected this uh, publication uh, because they, they developed an educational tool to help intensive care clinicians to really consider fungal infections when caring for COVID-19 patients when uh, on me mechanical ventilation in the ICU and when the clinical course is deteriorating. Because awareness is so important. If you do, are not aware of these infections, you will not diagnose them, you will not treat them, and the outcome will be dismal. And this was developed by a collaborative agreement between the CDC, the University of Alabama uh, at Birmingham, the Mycosis Study Group Education, and then a company. And so what they do, did is they developed a kind of checklist for uh, the medical doctors, uh, trainees in the ICU uh, with clinical criteria. So you can just check if your patient fulfills criteria that put them at risk for uh, invasive aspergillosis. And then they also have a diagnostic uh, checklist. I want to focus a little bit more on the invasive tracheobronchial aspergillosis because this was really a specific entity in the invasive pulmonary aspergillosis that entirely or predominantly involves the tracheobronchial tree. And when you look through bronchoscopy, you will see these ulcerations, nodules, pseudomembranes, scars, uh, 
in the trachea and the bronchi. And when you take a sample, you will culture aspergillus. And even in the bowel fluid, you may see the aspergillus heads. And why I'm uh, focusing a little bit on this, it's, for instance, here in the study, they looked in uh, hospitals in France uh, in the specific patient population with severe influenza in ICU. And this was a multi-center retrospective study. And so they all patients that came in with the diagnosis of influenza ICU and who had also the diagnosis of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis and were assessed through bronchoscopy were included. And so you see here that this invasive tracheobronchial aspergillosis entity was present in nearly 30% of patients in that category. And if you look here at uh, the biomarkers uh, in uh, these patients, and this is a beta d glucan level in serum, the galactomannan level in cell serum, you see that these levels are clearly higher than in the patients, the influenza patients with pulmonary aspergillosis, but without this tracheobronchial entity. And this is referring also, is correlating with the fungal load. And also, if you look in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, you see uh, that uh, the galactomannan levels are significantly higher. And so what they also looked at was mortality rate in these patients. And you see that this mortality rate was as high as 90% in this uh, subgroup. And you can argue, oh yeah, but maybe it was due to a diagnostic delay in these patients. But this was not the case because in this study, they did the diagnostic screening upon admission in ICU. And actually the diagnosis of the pulmonary aspergillosis was made earlier in this group than in the other patients with influenza. So here you see really that, uh, yeah, with our current diagnostic strategies and our current treatments we have available, we still are not able to care well for these patients. And so here there are really further studies needed to see if we can treat them better with a combination of antifungal therapies, or maybe we need the combination with inhaled antifungal therapies so we can get high concentrations of antifungals locally. And I must say this is the setting I'm often being uh, contacted from physicians in our hospital or from other hospitals because they are thinking, is there resistance of aspergillus against uh, triazoles because they are not responding? And of course, this is a possibility, but resistance in our setting, and I think this is a bit similar like here, is less than 10%. And so most of the time, there is no issue of resistance still there. We, we, we are not able to treat these patients well. And this is a headline in a, one of the new papers uh, in Belgium, actually in July 2021, saying that the dead rate due to the black fungus in India increases up to 4,252, uh, and that this outbreak is associated with COVID-19. And at that time, I got phone calls from journalists asking, can you explain a bit about this? And will this come also in our country? And also governmental uh, people contacted me to say, do we need to stockpile antifungals because because is that coming to us? And I reassured them, he said, no, I don't think we will suffer from the same as they are suffering in India. And uh, this is really a very nice representation from the uh, ACMM ISHAM guidelines, specifically for mucormycosis and ELMIC, showing the co-factor pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 associated mu uh, mucormycosis with also uh, the outdoor environment, which is important and which is certainly different if you compare it here to, uh, let's say, European con uh, countries to my own setting. Also, the steroid use, for instance, in an outpatient setting, yeah, this is not being used, let's say, in our country. And so this is research really from this institute, and they looked in the environment of patients suffering of COVID or recovering from COVID-19, and they looked for the presence of uh, mucoralis in the environment. And actually, they found them, and especially in the bedrooms of the patients, I learned from this publication. And they could even prove that they were genetically the same, what they found in, in the environment, in the near environment of the patient and the clinical isolate. And this is, of course, 
important because it supports a hypothesis that these patients with COVID-19 can become infected at home. And this points also that it might be important to take preventive measures at home. And I think research there will be important to see which kind of measures may help to decrease the risk, like ventilation, like wearing masks. Speaking of resistance, there I think candida auris is really the biggest threat, uh, considering fungal uh, resistance. And maybe you are all familiar with this uh, proposed scheme or hypothesis about the sudden emergence of candida auris all over the world by Arturo Cassi de Val. And there in the hypothesis, Candida auris is already available or was already available, present in wetlands. Uh, and then due to the global warming, uh, some uh, clades were able to reproduce or to grow at higher temperature. And so there is the possibility that they were transported by birds from these wetlands to more rural environments where there is a close contact with humans. And of course, when these people migrate to the city and enter hospitals, there is a possibility to enter Candida auris in these hospitals. And of course, because of this, Many people now start looking and submit research projects for where can this candida auris be found in the nature environment. And also in India, research was being done on that. And actually, by the group of Anurata, they did found uh, candida auris uh, in the Andaman Islands, very remote uh, area uh, in India. And also more recently, there was the hypothesis that, for instance, stored apples could be as a reservoir of selection of transmission of azo-resistant candida auris. So when freshly picked apples are being checked, no candida auris was on these fruits. However, apples are stored for long periods of time. They are handled by persons. They are coated with waxes and also containing fungicides. And so what they noticed is that they could find candida auris later on during storage. And so this could maybe be a place for selection and amplification of azo-resistant candida auris. And so I think this is also an important hypothesis to study further and on other fruits and vegetables. And I just want to say that in, in Europe, we are also seeing increasing numbers of cases and outbreaks of candida auris. You see here in light blue are the countries with only imported cases. And initially it was all light blue and there were just local outbreaks. But now you see, and also in Belgium, we do now diagnose our first cases which are acquired in Belgium without a travel history. And for instance, in Spain, it is already endemically there. So I think the fact that the WHO uh, published in autumn last year a fungal priority pathogen list is really important to push forward research, the development and public health actions. And it might not be a surprise that here in the critical group, we do have Candida auris, but also Aspergillus fumigatus, Candida albicans, Cryptococcus neoformans. Now a few words about the diagnostic uh, test. And there were large surveys during the la uh, last year being conducted and published, also one by the ECMM ISHAM in Asia Pacific region. And it were online electronic case reports that were being sent. Many, many cases did responded for 40 countries, territories from this region. Uh, a lot of responses, 25% from India. And this gives some insights about what is the current state of mycology, laboratory mycology in Asian Pacific region. And so to give an idea about the profile of the institutes or the people that responded, 44% were from university hospitals. And you see microscopy culture was nearly universally present. But then Malditov mass spectrometry, which is a very powerful tool for rapid and accurate identification of fungi, was only present in 40% of the labs. And you see here that there is a clear correlation with the GDP per capita with the presence, because of course it are expensive instruments, you need to be able to, 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 to buy them. The moment you have them, the consumables are generally speaking quite uh, cheap, but the investment is, is big. 
And for antifungal susceptibility testing, I think 80, more than 80% of the labs did perform antifungal susceptibility testing, which is quite nice. And, and it's certainly, uh, it's the same as, as in Europe, I can say. Uh, of course, there are a, a proportion of labs only doing susceptibility tests for yeast and another proportion uh, doing for yeast and malts. But I guess several of these labs only doing for yeast maybe transfer uh, samples to reference labs. For the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis, aspergillus antigen test is really crucial. You see it's present there in 70%. I think also for pneumocystis aerovecchi pneumonia, PCR is really crucial, especially if you go out of the HIV population to the other uh, patients at risk. So there, I think that's something that really should uh, improve further. And for the mucoralis, well, there recent research also shows that this PCR really can have an added value, especially in patients with pulmonary disease or gastrointestinal disease where you cannot directly take a biopsy. We saw that culture and, identi uh, culture and uh, identification was present in nearly all labs, but of course, we all know that it depends on expertise. And that was also the role Pushpa Talwar really had. You, you can do culture, but you need to be able to uh, interpret your cultural results uh, and also cor correctly identify your strains and also give advice to your clinicians how uh, these patients can be treated. And these are just some examples of courses uh, being organized in, in, in Europe. But I found this also uh, on the internet and I knew that this institute is very, very active on uh, planning and organizing these courses. And I think the importance of these courses cannot be stressed enough because you really need in the different centers people who are aware and thus know uh, the, the basic uh, things about it so they can establish it in their own center. I think there is some good news about antigen detection issues. It started with the Galactomelan test for aspergillosis. The ELISA came to market, and everybody used the Biorat ELISA. And we did for decades, first in, in serum, then in BAL. But it was waiting so long for a rapid test, and, uh, a prototype, a lateral flow device test. And then, no, these lateral flow device tests are there. And what you see, there is really an expansion of these antigen test. And I think that's really a very positive evolution. And especially this rapid single sample test may be implemented, I think, very well also in elmic environment. And also urine is now a new sample type being uh, looked at more, more deeply. And so the choices for these tests are expanding and it's really good. What, of course, is important to, to realize is that the validation of these different tests is still limited. So you need to be critical and validate also the tests yourself or look if there is in literature data about it. Um, and when you have big numbers of tests, then an ELISA format is appropriate. But if you have single samples or a few numbers, then I think these rapid tests are, are very, very practical. And also for the beta deglutican test, which is a more panfungal marker, initially we did it with the fungital test and you had to do it in batch and run standards in double and your samples in doubles. But now we do have the WACL test, which allows also single sample testing. You get a ray agent, you just add your sample. And the difference is that with the previous test, you, do, you batch it. It's good for studies, but for patient care, and we want it for patient care, if you have to, to, to batch your samples and say, wait a week before you get a result, this is really not a good thing to have. With this test, you can say, we receive a sample in the lab and we do the test and the patient and the, 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 the clinician taking care for the patient gets the result the day itself. And I saw also here at this institute, they are doing an evaluation or did do an evaluation of this WACO test, finding very similar results as other studies, saying that if you, you had a very, very good specificity and the sensitivity, well, you can increase, uh, increase by lowering the cutoff, which is set a bit too high by the company. I already alluded to the fact that in COVID-19 patients, it's really difficult, especially, to make the, the differentiation between colonization and infection and to know 
will I need to start treatment or not? And so uh, here in this retrospective study in two university hospitals in pa Paris, they looked uh, and they uh, checked what the survival was depending on the number of microbiological criteria that were fulfilled, the number of microbiological tests that were positive. And here you see a clear correlation, more microbiological tests positive, a really worse uh, outcome. And I think, uh, yes, for the, the identification of our patients and making the diagnosis, we, we are now combining much more tests, but we, we need more intelligence algorithms to, to interpret them. Now it's, and also for the definitions, it's quite simple. How may, if this test is positive, you are in the probable category. I think we need to integrate more all the results we get. Also take into account the negative results because this is also very informative and uh, we need to come up with more, uh, let's say, intelligent algorithms. And for the mucorelis, I just allude here to, I think this is a very nice study being conducted also in France. And there are now many commercial assays available, but you can also have your own developed test. And it's clear from this test, look for uh, mucorelis DNA in serum that the sensitivity and specificity is really quite good. And that it is an early marker being positive often before your culture is positive or you have the result of your histopathology. And it gives also some pro prognostic information. When your PCR in the blood remains positive, all these patients died. And I think what we really need here also is that this antigen, that we have antigen detection tests for mucorrhizis as we have for aspergillosis. I see some developments there, so I think the future uh, will tell, but I hope in the near future some of these tests will become available and will also maybe be game changers. And I can uh, imagine, especially in countries like India, with high incidences, with very broad countries, with diff huge differences in facilities available, this could be very, very important. And then finally, some words about antifungals. And of course, it could be a topic on its own, but I see looking, okay, time is running. And uh, therefore, I had the idea just to refer to this, I think, really excellent article by Martin Hoenlinger, Rosanna Spruter as first authors, because they really uh, provide excellent information about the antifungal pipeline. And of course, I know these drugs will not be available tomorrow, but at least there are important evolutions there. For instance, if we look at Ibrexafen herb, this is a first in class oral glucan synthase inhibitor with a similar mechanism of action as the echinocandins, echinocandins but different binding sites. Phosphomanjokepekes, Fosman Hopekis now has a novel uh, mechanism of action, also a very broad spectrum uh, of activity, which makes it an attractive drug, olorofim. Also, another mechanism of action. It's important to see that it are not only analogs, but that new mechanisms of action uh, in by new drugs are really entering, let's say, the, the fungal pipeline. And here, this is also a drug, olorofim, being active on Cedusporium species. Otherwise, we had to say, sorry, we really have no treatment option at all. With these drugs, there is now some perspective for these patients and, for instance, also for trisole-resistant aspergillus. Also, rezafungin is a second-generation echinocandin with a prolonged uh, half-life, which uh, enables one once weekly uh, dosing, which is also attractive in certain settings. And then opelconazole, it's a triazole, but it's uh, an inhaled antifungal broad-spectrum triazole. So I told you about the tracheobronchial uh, manifestation. Maybe this could help to get very low, high uh, concentrations locally and to, to, to decrease mortality in this uh, patient population. And in this manuscript, you have very nice pictures, I think, and, and schemes. For instance, considering the spectrum, eh? so you can learn these new drugs, where do they have their activity? You see here the mucorrhizis. We still need 
new drugs with activity on this mycorrhizae. This is very much needed. And what I think is also very, very nice in this manuscript that must have taken really a lot of time by these authors to, 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 to draw them and produce them. You see also all the different clinical trials uh, that are ongoing. I just picked a few of them here to, to put here on the screen and uh, to put uh, together. So if you are uh, looking for some information about the new drugs, you can find really a lot in there. But if there is maybe one message I want to give is that for better diagnosis and treatment of fungal infections, you really need a multidisciplinary approach, multidisciplinary with surgeons, mycologists, microbiologists, treating physicians who can say, yes, because of this drug, he or she is certainly at risk. It becomes so complex with all these new different kind of immunomodulating drugs, uh, hospital pharmacists, uh, and I must say today, by being in the lab and going to, to, to the hospital, I already saw, and that's also what you said, that was already initiated by Pushpa Talwar so many years ago, this multidisciplinary approach, people from the lab not staying in the lab, but going to the wards, discussing the patients. I think this is really the way we should handle it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Katrin, for sharing wonderful uh, evolution of medical mycology. So now it's a uh, turn for presentation of award of honor. So I'll request Professor Neelam Taneja and Professor Shiva Prakash to accompany our esteemed director uh, to present the award to Professor Katrin. And I'll also request uh, Sub-Dean Academics, Professor Naresh Panda, and Sub-Dean Research, Professor Ratho, to accompany our director, sir. Thank you. So I'll now request Professor Naresh Panda to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, good evening. Uh, Professor uh, Katrin Lagru, the, the guest orator for uh, Professor Pushpatalwar's oration today, Professor Vivek Lal, uh, the director of PGI, uh, Professor R.K. Ratho, Subdean Research, uh, um, Professor Arunalok Chakravarti, uh, the former head of the Department of Medical Microbiology, other faculty members and dear friends. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Katrin, for uh, a very wonderful uh, elucidation of the fungal, uh, the invasive fungal infections. And as um, you know, Professor Vivek Lal in his introduction had said that uh, the the seeds for the division of mycology in PGI was set up by Professor Pushpa Talwar, and there was another legendary figure, and that was Professor Wayan Mehra. He was my uh, teacher here, and I remember as a resident when uh, you know he one day uh, he observed a plain radiograph of maxillary sinus and saw a hyperdense shadow in the maxillary sinus and said, I, I feel something different in this. And uh, he told another friend of mine who was from a southern state who did not was not very well conversant with. Uh, Hindi, and he asked me that, you know, why don't you accompany and meet uh, Professor Pushpa Talwar? So both of us went and then told that Dr. Mehra has sent us, and then this is what he has observed, so we should, uh, you know, think about it. And Madam was so kind and so, you know, happy about it, said, oh, we, we, we need to look at this, yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, not only, you know, Professor Pushpa Talwar, uh, set the Department of Mycology, Medical Microbiology on a global map, but he, she motivated another young guy that time, and that was Professor Arunalok Chakravarti, who not only you know consolidated the you know the Department of uh, Division of Mycology that time and took it to the world stage, and now it is uh, 
you know, the Professor Siva Prakash is continuing this good work which was left over by Professor Aruna Lok Chakravarti. So thank you very much, uh, you know, for uh, for a very nice lecture, and thank you uh, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. So now, uh, now I'll request everyone to join for high tea downstairs. Thank you. <laughs>